Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU podcast. As always, thank you for joining me. In this episode, I will review LSU's sweep of the Ole Miss Rebels in Oxford. I will go over each of the three games. What were the three big things that I learned this weekend? How did my get right, stay right list predictions do? And then finally, the SEC rundown. As always, you can find the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, all the other major audio platforms. Make sure to check out the YouTube channel under 60 feet, 6 inches LSU pod so that you don't miss out on any of the content throughout the season. And then finally, follow me on Twitter at 60FT6INLSU pod. If you missed the last episode, I previewed the Ole Miss series. As always, that content is linked on the YouTube channel and in podcast form as well. I will tell you this. Some of the things that I went over during the preview episode uh, ended up showing throughout the weekend. So make sure to catch out that content on the, all the preview episodes. And I kind of made reference to some of those things uh, on Twitter throughout the weekend as I watched Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and the sweep unfolds right in front of our eyes. So let's get into it. LSU sweeps in dramatic fashion. Nonetheless, as they finally get it done, they get their first sweep on the year. This puts LSU at 32-7 and seven on the season. They are 12-5 and five in SEC play. Next weekend, LSU welcomes Alabama into town for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. And Bama is actually coming off a sweep of their own versus Missouri this past weekend. Before we get into the games, though, LSU didn't have a sweep this weekend. And as I mentioned before, I will take two out of three in the SEC every weekend and hopefully – you know, the goal is for them to go 20 and 10 every year in conference play. That's going to set you up very well for regionals and for being a host site every season. But when you look at this weekend's uh, results in the SEC, you saw Arkansas get swept. Vandy got swept. Florida got swept by South Carolina. So it was a big opportunity that LSU had to deliver and to gain some ground on those SEC opponents and those teams. And LSU did just that by coming from behind and beating Ole Miss in game three. So let's get into it. Friday night, LSU wins the opener, 7-3. to three. And the story of the game was twofold, in my opinion. First, it was the pitching of Paul Skeens, as he was dominant once again. So let's start off with him. Skeens, on the night, goes six innings pitched, four hits, three runs, three earned, three walks, and 11 Ks. So another double-digit K performance from Skeens. He threw 117 pitches on the night, and he was fabulous, I thought. He made one bad pitch on the night, and that was to Will Furness, who got the barrel out and hit a three-run home run. And obviously, if that name sounds familiar, he is the son of LSU legend and former guest on the 60 Feet 6 Inches LSU podcast, Eddie Furness. But Skeens dominated Ole Miss besides just that one pitch, and that was just a fastball that snuck back over the middle of the plate. Hats off to Furness for doing what he did with that pitch. And you can continue to see teams – They try to adjust to Paul Skeens, and he gets it done in different ways, right? Early in the year, you saw him go predominantly with fastballs as some of the non-conference opponents just couldn't catch up to his stuff. Then you saw him right before conference play start to throw a lot of sliders, more so than he had previously, and he started to lead guys off with sliders and at bats. And then Arkansas and Tennessee, you really saw Skeens have to use his whole repertoire as those teams could really hit. But then last weekend against Kentucky, you saw Skeens go predominantly slider, right? The fastball, it was there. The velocity is always going to be there, but the location wasn't. So he went 60 to 70% sliders, if I had to guess. And I think the majority, if not uh, all but one or two of his strikeouts were on sliders. But you continue to see the evolution of Paul Skeens if you paid attention this year. And so what he did this week against Ole Miss was not as a lot of sliders, almost predominantly fastballs. I bet he threw 80% fastballs out of the 117 pitches. He threw some sliders, threw a couple change-ups, one or two curveballs. But to me, the the fastball inside to lefties was phenomenal. Usually you see him when he goes away to lefties, he throws two-seam fastballs. But this weekend, his fastball into lefties, I don't know if it was a true two-seam or his four-seam had some two-seam action, meaning it was coming back over the inside corner to lefties, but it was impressive. As you saw him finish off, Gonzalez, Furness, um, uh, McCants, other guys that they had that were left-handed hitters. You saw him finish those guys off time and time again, fastballs into lefties. And that's just impressive. As his repertoire 
as uh, his ability to evolve as teams adjust to him, he's doing the same thing on the other side. I would imagine that's something him and Wes Johnson are doing week in and week out. But that was really impressive to see Skeens do that against this Ole Miss team. And I guess if you're going to say a downside to Paul Skeens is that, I don't know if you want to call the fact that your ace continues to get double-digit strikeout performances week in and week out a downside, but the fact that he strikes out a ton of people, so he's going to throw a lot of pitches. And he threw 117 on the night. He's not able to make it into the seventh inning. But what you did see is you saw Griffin Herring come in for Skeens, and he finished off the game, right? He threw seven, eight, nine. Herring goes three innings pitched, zero hits, two walks, three Ks, and he bounced back from a um, – a little bit of a rough outing against Kentucky. So it was good to see that young man throw well, throw good again in the SEC. And look, anytime that Herring or Gidry, those freshmen go out there and they succeed, that just builds confidence for the future. And when I say future, I mean postseason play. So every time they have a good outing, they're able to stack good outings back to back to back. That just gets them through kind of another uh, step in their maturation process as they as Herring threw really well in relief of schemes. And I like the fact that you have Herring coming in, right? Herring throws hard for a lefty. He's 90 to 94 with a good slider. But you got Skeens, the righty in the velo, and you have Herring, who's just a completely different look. So I really like that combination that they used on Friday. Let's get to the hitting from the Friday night game. LSU, they get a run across in the first on a Dylan Cruz triple, and then Tommy White singles them in. I call it a single. Ole Miss official score called it an error. It was a rocket to Jacob Gonzalez. So they did that kid a disservice by giving him two errors on the night. I'm going to call it a single. LSU scores another run in the third inning. Look, but after the Will Furness home run that puts Ole Miss up 3-2, to two, Tommy Tanks comes up the next inning with a grand slam to dead center field to answer Ole Miss in the inning. You have a Dugas walk, a Morgan single, a Cruz walk leading up to the Tommy Tanks grand slam. And look, he just does it again. It's, you see continue, teams continue to try to pitch around or work around Dylan Cruz, try to get him to chase. And Cruz is just patient enough to take the walk, knowing Tommy White is right behind him. Kentucky had tried to do it, and Tanks burned them a couple times. And once again, Ole Miss tries to do it, and Tanks burns them again, seeing the first pitch he sees in that at bat and taking it for a grand slam. LSU gets another run in the eighth as they secure game one, seven to three. On Saturday, LSU wins the game 8-4, to four, and look, it's another standout performance from a hitter and then from a pitcher. Let's talk about that pitcher first, and then that is Ty Floyd, and he was awesome this game, and I'm really happy for Ty. This is the type of outing that he is capable of week in and week out in SEC play. In this outing, he flashed his changeup a little bit. He flashed his breaking ball some, but once again, it was a fastball heavy outing for Ty Floyd. And this time, he was hitting his spots. He was keeping the ball down in the zone. And finally, he didn't get squeezed. It always feels like Ty is the victim of a small strike zone. Well, this weekend, especially on Saturday, the zone was a little bigger. It was that way for both teams now. And Floyd took advantage of it. He absolutely pounded the outside corner to lefties and to righties, taking advantage of that extra inch, inch and a half the umpire was giving him. Hats off to Floyd. On the day, Floyd goes eight and a third innings pitched, five hits, three runs, three earned, one walk, eight Ks. Once again, he is over the 100 pitch limit as he goes 111 pitches. And you can see that the LSU staff is really trying to let these guys get their pitch count up, if possible, obviously not endangering their arms. And they're trying to get their arms and legs in shape before it gets really, really hot and to prepare them for postseason play. Floyd, much like Skeens, dominated Ole Miss. He made one bad pitch, just like Skeens did to Will Furness. Floyd, one bad pitch to Alderman, who made him pay with a three-run home run to center field. But that was it. That was all, all Ole Miss had to show for it. And at the time of the home run, LSU was up 7 to nothing at that point. But I want to see Ty Floyd build off of this really, really good outing. I want to see him stack this outing. And then his next outing versus Alabama on top of each other and build some momentum towards the back half of the season. And that's what he's going to need to do for LSU to be successful and to get where they want to get. So hats off to Ty Floyd. Just what a really, really good outing. Happy for that young man as he threw well. And I think he just kind of needed that boost of confidence. And uh, hopefully now the LSU fan base will kind of back off Ty Floyd a little bit.
You also saw Nate Atkenhausen come in for Floyd as he threw two thirds of an inning. So it was uh, really his first outing. You've seen him throw in a couple weeks after suffering a hamstring injury. So it was good to see him come out. Hopefully he is injury free and he that hamstring is not super sore after that outing as he is going to be a major piece moving forward for the LSU pin. He was for the LSU pin before he got hurt. And then as you get to the back half of the season, you add another lefty in that pin to go along with Herring and Cooper. And then Coleman, who knows what his role is going to evolve into. Ackenhausen, good to see him get back out on the bump in SEC action. Turning towards the hitters in game two. While the pitching side was all about Ty Floyd, the hitting side on Saturday was all about Dylan Cruz. Cruz gets LSU on the board in the first with a two-run home run and not to be outdone. In the second, you saw Pearson get a single as he returned to the lineup, which was good to see him get some PT, and I thought he looked really good this weekend. Travinsky follows that up with a walk. Travinsky got into the lineup for the first time, and I thought he had some massive at-bats, and we'll get to the biggest A-B of the weekend for the Sunday game. So Pearson single, Travinsky walk. Dugas walks. Morgan gets out, but then Cruz comes up and hits a grand slam to put LSU up 6 to nothing in the second inning. You saw Beloso hit a solo home run in the fifth, and then Travinsky drives in another run in the seventh. But back to Dylan Cruz. There's really nothing else that I can say or any other announcer can say that uh, we haven't seen for the past couple years as fans. I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit just to let y'all know that Cruz went 7 for 13 on the weekend. So that's kind of what he's supposed to do. The guy's hitting close to 500, so he's doing just what he needs to do, which is absolutely crazy to think about. And look, Cruz is just him. He's that dude. He's the best player in the country, the probable or possible number one overall pick in the Major League Baseball draft. I've sung his praises all year, and I will continue to do so, as he is just an absolute dude. The thing that impresses me, one, he can hit with power to all fields. He continues to take walks, and he just doesn't get outside of himself. He doesn't really press. You may have seen it a couple times this year where he rolled over in some balls throughout some weekends, and it was like a mini slump, and I put him on the get-right list. But all in all, Dylan Cruz is just an absolute stud. Two-run home run, grand slam. He beats Ole Miss by himself on Saturday, and he carries LSU to an 8-4 to victory. All right, let's get to that unbelievably exciting finale on Sunday as LSU comes away with a 7-6 to win in dramatic fashion, securing the sweep on the road for the Tigers. Let's start off with pitching. You saw Christian Little get his get another SEC start again, and it was a little shaky early on for Little. But look, after the second inning, he settled down and dealt for innings 3, 4, and 5. He gave up a single run in the first, a single run in the second. He just kind of left some balls up. Uh, his stuff looked good on the day, I thought, but then he throws up three zeros in a row, and I thought that was massive for him and for LSU. A zero in the third, fourth, and the fifth. He gets into the sixth, he gives up a double, but then he gets an out, and he gets pulled for Javen Coleman. But on the day, Christian Little goes five and a third innings pitched, six hits, three runs, three earned, one walk, and three Ks. And you didn't see him throw a ton of fastballs, and you still saw every now and then when he did throw his fastball, his velocity was still up there. He was still 92 to 94, and we know he can bump it up to 96, 97 if he needs to. But you really saw him stick to his changeup and his cutter mainly. And once he got settled in, you saw a lot of first pitch outs, a lot of lazy fly balls to the outfield, specifically Cruz. And um, I thought it was massive for him to settle down. And it's almost – I really thought he got better the longer he stayed in the game. So hats off to Christian Little. Remember, against Kentucky, his first three innings were fabulous. And then in the fourth, he just kind of lost it. So it was really good to see him go five, get into the sixth, and him settle down and have some clean innings in the middle of that outing. Once again, if LSU can get this production from him moving forward, you can't ask much more from that. And then he had a fully rested bullpen going into Sunday. So obviously he knows that. So his mentality, I would think, is, look, I'm going to go as hard as I can for as long as I can, and whatever happens, happens. But I got four dudes in the bullpen that are rested and ready to roll, and that's what you saw on the Sunday game. So after Little, I mentioned you saw Javen Coleman come in, and he got his first SEC action of the season. And look, his results were okay. I didn't think he did terrible. I didn't think he did great. But to me, anytime Coleman can throw and you get the report that he is pain-free the next day, that's a win for LSU. 
if he continues to recover, recover from Tommy John. And I would think the goal for him is they're going to continue to stretch him out in hopes that he could be a starter by the end of the season to where he could get you four, maybe five in the SEC tournament. If for some reason you lose a game in a regional or a starter gets knocked out in the super regional, Coleman can come in and really stretch the game, much like a Thatcher Hurd can do the same as well. Coleman goes two innings pitched, three hits, three runs, one walk, one K. He did give up the go-ahead home run to Alderman. And then you saw Collins come in, Cooper come in, and then finally Gavin Gidry shuts it down in the ninth to preserve the victory for LSU. But Gavin Gidry, I'll tell you what, I'm sure if y'all like me, I held my breath whenever Ethan Lazier hit that ball off of Gidry in the ninth. I really thought that ball was gone off the bat. But you saw Stevenson, who's very comfortable, very good defensive outfielder. He makes a really nice play up against the wall. And then um, Gidry shuts it down to preserve the LSU victory. And it's good to see him get thrown into those situations. Obviously, been in that situation myself. There, that, that is not easy. On the road, one run lead. He gets an out. Then he gives up a uh, double, I believe. And um, I could be mistaken. But to have that ball, you know, go all the way to the fence. And, you know, and as a pitcher, you're like, off the bat, you know if he caught it or not. And then he finally gets the out after that. So hats off to that young man. Once again, just like Herring, anytime he can get an outing like that in the SEC, it just helps with his progression, and it'll give him confidence further down the road into postseason play. In terms of hitting on Sunday, I thought it was an up-and-down day for LSU, and they never really pulled away from Ole Miss. But in the end, obviously, they got the W. You saw LSU jump out to an early lead with a first, with a, excuse me, a run in the first on three consecutive singles by Dugas, Morgan, and Cruz. And I thought they were going to set themselves up to get two or three runs to really jump out ahead of Ole Miss. Uh, but they didn't. It was really kind of a letdown, as you saw three Ks after that. And the problem is, after that, you saw Tommy White get pulled. And what I can only imagine is an undisclosed injury. Um, I haven't heard anything further on that at the time of this recording, but hopefully he is healthy on uh, moving forward. So when he gets pulled, Joe Bear moves from right to third, and then Pearson came into right field. Look, LSU scratches two more runs with back-to-back -back singles in the third by Thompson and Jones. They get another solo home run by Beloso in the fifth, and that puts LSU up four to two. But that lead just never felt safe, and Ole Miss claws their way back into the game, finally tying it up in the seventh on a solo home run by Alderman. And then they took the lead in the eighth on a two-run home run by a guy with four hits on the year, hitting 125. And I don't know if y'all saw the broadcast, but he talked to his third base coach before he got in the box. And you can see the third base coach saying, look, just sit on a fastball. And that's what that kid did. He ambushes a fastball by Coleman. He gets the barrel out. He's a big kid, a uh, big freshman. And he hits the ball into the left field bullpen. And that's a fear, right? When you let teams hang around and they eventually work their way back to where they tie it, somebody like that on one swing can take the lead. And that's exactly what it did. But really all it did was set up the stage for uh, Hayden Travinsky. So LSU's down six to four into the ninth. Two outs. Jones draws a massive walk because he struggled this weekend. Then Joe Bear gets hit by a pitch, and that bing brings up Travinsky. He pinch hits for Malazzo. He goes down in the count one to two, but he gets a hanging slider from the Ole Miss pitcher, and he absolutely crushes that ball over the left field fence to give LSU a seven to six lead, which they will not relinquish. But I'm going to be the first one to admit, I thought the game was over, to be honest. LSU is holding on by the skin of their teeth. Ole Miss scratches and claws and finally an improbable home run. It's, you just see it time and time again. That's enough to bring the home team, the crowd to their feet, obviously, and uh, spur the home team on to victory. But LSU does a great job of not giving up with Jones drawing a two-out walk. Look, he could have gone up there with two outs and just flailed away, tried to hit a home run, but he does a great job of getting the next guy up to the plate. Joe Bear stands in there, as LSU always does, gets hit, and then Travinsky wins it with a three-run home run. All right, quickly, let's review my three keys to the weekend that I talked about on the preview podcast. One, the starting pitchers have to step up. They obviously did that. All three guys went over five innings. They were fabulous. Two, they have to put the game away. They can't let Ole Miss hang around. I think LSU answered in game one with the Tanks Grand Slam. LSU pulled away in game two. They got out in front, and they never let off the gas with Dylan Cruz providing the power in that game. Game three was the problem, right? 
as LSU, that game was back and forth. LSU takes the lead, but they let Ole Miss hang around, and you can see what happens on the road when you do that. As Ole Miss takes the lead, but LSU answers, and they grit out the win. And finally, in my preview podcast, the third key I had was let Ole Miss be Ole Miss. They're not a good team. They're 3-12 and for a reason. Keep the crowd out of it. Keep the beer showers to a minimum. LSU did just that as they dominated Ole Miss for the majority of the series. All right, what are the three big things that I learned after the Ole Miss series? One, LSU starting pitching this weekend was very impressive, and it is something that a lot of LSU fans have been waiting to see. Performances like this on the weekend, if they're done on a consistent basis from here on out, that's something that can carry you really to where you want to get, and that's to Omaha. And then who knows what happens once you get there. The key is, can Ty Floyd and Christian Little repeat their performance from Ole Miss? Can they repeat that this weekend against Bama and then against the other teams like State, Auburn, and Georgia from here on out? I'm not ready to say, check it, check the box. They're a done deal. They're going to deal every game two and game three from here on out. I'm not ready to take that step yet. I just have to see those guys do it on another weekend, right? Another consistent basis to where Floyd gets into the sixth and seventh and then Little can get back into the fifth again. So it's a wait and see for me as of now, but this past weekend was definitely a step forward for the starting pitching staff. The second big thing that I learned, this team does not quit. And you have seen it throughout the year. When they are down, they do not give up. They feel like they are never out of a game. And when you have hitters like that, you should feel like that. Those guys can run balls out the yard at a moment's notice. And you saw that again, even with guys coming off the bench, they are ready to perform. And you got to love that as an LSU fan moving forward. But one of the things that I will say, at this point in time, I may catch some flack for this, but I do think this team lacks a little bit of a killer instinct. I do think that sense of urgency is lacking at times. Case in point is that they had chances for a sweep against A&M and Tennessee, and it didn't happen. They had a chance to put Ole Miss away in game three, and they let them hang around and almost took the L for it. So, look, part of this team is they have a lot of young guys that they're counting on in the bullpen and in the lineup you've seen throughout the year with Neil, Jones, Kling. I know a couple of those guys are hurt. Also, this team is trying to get back to where they – nobody on this team has been except for really Jay Johnson, Riley Cooper, and Bryce Collins, right? They're trying to win a Super Regional and trying to get back to Omaha. Omaha, excuse me. So part of this is growing pains. It's it's part of the getting through the – the pressure barrier process, right? They're trying to learn how to graduate to that next level. So you're going to see some of that, but they really, I think, need to develop that killer instinct because I would hate to see them lose a game late in the year in a super regional or uh, maybe a a game where they could try to put a team away in Omaha if they get that far because they just kind of lollygagged around and didn't take advantages of the opportunities that present themselves. I'm not saying they can't develop that. I'm just saying right now, I'm seeing a little bit of that lack of a killer instinct. But in the end, look, they do not quit. They do not give up no matter what the score is. Uh, You saw that in Tennessee, right? They were down by a ton of runs. They had a chance to come back and really put Tennessee on notice there. They just couldn't get it done. The lead was too great. But Hayden Travinsky coming off the bench, not giving up with two strikes. That just uh, shows the mentality and the grit of this team. The third thing that I learned this weekend – Boy, does this team, man, they need like a week at the spa, right? They need a week off. They need to get healthy. They are all kinds of banged up. Shores and Edwards, I don't know what's going to happen with them, but uh, they seem to be out for the foreseeable future. But you got a Ackenhausen and Coleman back to kind of take their place. So that's a good sign. Neil and Kling are hurt right now, but you've seen guys like Pearson, Malazzo, Travinsky step up in their absences. You saw Tommy White leave the game on Sunday, early in the game. And Dugas, he obviously, if you watched him play this weekend, he is not 100%. I would say he's 80%. Luckily, they did not have to turn a double play this weekend because I have no clue if he would have been able to make that throw uh, from second base. But you could tell in some of his swings that he was wincing. So he obviously is not 100%. Trey Morgan in game three takes a pitch off the wrist, and he's wincing in pain throughout the rest of the game. So. On the flip side, the good thing is that this team is very deep and you have different guys that have been able to step up when called upon. 
as I mentioned, Travinsky, Malazzo, Pearson. I thought they all looked really good this weekend. And then you're starting to see the pitching side of things in the bullpen. Some of these guys are beginning to get healthy, like Ackenhausen, and then finally um, Javen Coleman. And in their absence, you've seen freshmen like Herring and Gidry have to step up, and they've handled uh, their roles admirably here on out in SEC play. It's just scary to think, right? Allow yourself to think about LSU being as fully healthy as you could be. Take Shores and Edwards out of the equation, right? But everybody else is fully healthy, and the experience and the talent that you have on the bench, LSU is a scary team moving forward once they hit that uh, fully health status, if you will. Now, one more thing I, I do want to bring up. If I had a fourth big thing, I would mention this. But uh, before we get into the get right, stay right list and we finish the pot off with the SEC rundown, I do want to mention this. Watching the games this weekend, <clears throat> they got the sweep, which is great. That is the overall arching theme. You needed a sweep. You got the sweep when you had a chance to do it. And you'll come home to Baton Rouge with that in tow. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think LSU played really well this weekend. Granted, Ole Miss is bad. And it's still an SEC sweep. But I think if you ask Jay Johnson, did y'all play great? I bet you he would tell you no. And this is what I mean. LSU hit 252 on the weekend. They had 38 strikeouts, 20 walks, and they left 32 runners on base. In my opinion, they didn't hit the ball well at all. When the team comes in hitting over 300 on the year and you hit 252, I don't think that's a great weekend. <clears throat> LSU only had nine extra base hits on the entire weekend, and six of those extra base hits were home runs. Now, out of those home, LSU scored 22 runs on the weekend. So the home runs contributed 13 of those runs out of the 22. So my point is they relied a bunch on the long ball this weekend. Besides that, they just hit singles all over the place. Guys really struggled this weekend. Now, that's going to happen every weekend. One or two guys are going to struggle, but it felt like to me this weekend, it was it felt like almost over half of the lineup really struggled. And you had guys hitting spurts, right? White the first game, Cruz the second game, and they kind of pieced it together in the third game. Beloso had a couple of solo shots, you know, but <clears throat> Gavin Dugas struggled. And look, I don't think he's 100%, but he still struggled. Two for 13, nine Ks. Jones struggled. Two for 14, six Ks. And then finally, Thompson, who's been hot lately, Thompson struggled. Two for 13, seven Ks. And he had just gotten his average up above 300. Now he's around 270. So Dugas, Jones, Thompson, right? That's a 30-year lineup. That really, they gave you a little production here and there. But all in all, the totality of the weekend, they didn't give you anything. And they struck out a ton. Between those three guys, you had 22 strikeouts. That's a, that's a massive amount of strikeouts. And yes, once again, they swept. But these are things that are just a little concerning to me. And the other thing, too, is, look, Ole Miss, their arms were not very impressive to me. They didn't have a bunch of high velo guys coming in like you've seen with um, Arkansas or Tennessee. But I will tell you one thing this team does better than any other team LSU's face, and this is because of Mike Bianco, who I played for, and he calls pitches just like Skip did. All the Ole Miss pitchers had breaking balls for a strike. They could throw it for a strike. They could throw it on the corner, and then they could bounce it when they needed to. And LSU struggled with that, right? You would you saw times where uh, Jared Jones, like he wasn't getting a fastball at all. And I don't know if he finally figured that out. But he would get like one fastball on AB. But if they would, Ole Miss would throw that dude seven sliders in a row. Once they realized like Thompson or Dugas or Jones couldn't lay off the slider away, they were just going to pound them with that slider away. And they had the ability to throw it on the corner. That's what Skip had us do, and that's exactly the way Bianco calls pitches, right? He's going to throw your fastballs in every now and then. He's going to stay almost completely on the outside of the plate, and he's going to throw a lot of breaking balls for strikes, and that's what they did. And LSU's hitters really had trouble adjusting to that kind of pitch pattern to me. All right, how did my get right, stay right list do? On the get right, I had Skeens, Floyd, and Little. All three hits for me. Right. All those three guys did their job and dominated this weekend. We've talked about it ad nauseum, just how great they were. But I will give you one more stat, just how good the LSU pitching staff did as a whole this weekend. They limited Ole Miss to a 210 batting average this weekend. Phenomenal job by the staff as a whole, but specifically phenomenal job by those three starters. On the stay right list, I had Collins. 
He only threw once. He threw a third of an inning with a walk on Sunday. I'll call that a miss. He just didn't really have a chance to showcase his ability and how well he's been doing off the mound this weekend. Tommy White, he was on the stay right list. Massive grand slam in game one. But on the weekend, he went two for 10. He came out in game three. Just have to assume it's an injury at this point. And also, if it's an injury, was it lingering before that? So who knows if he was fighting through something or battling something and it just finally came to a head on game three, and he just told James Johnson, look, I just can't go. I'm going to be a detriment to the team. You need to put somebody else in there. So uh, I guess I'll call that a miss or a push because that grand slam is kind of keeping me afloat right there. Stay right. Last guy on the list I had was Joe Bear. He was two for eight on the weekend with a double and three Ks. He did have a very important hit by pitch in the ninth as he stood in there and took that in game three, allowing Travinsky to come up and hit the three-run bomb. But uh, I will call that a miss on the weekend for myself. So did great on the get right, did not do great on the stay right. All right, wrapping up here on the 60 feet, 6 inches LSU pod, let's take a look at the SEC rundown as it was basically sweeps weekend in the SEC. Tennessee swept Vanderbilt as Tennessee needed that to really write their season. South Carolina continues to roll along. Very impressive sweep at home against Florida. Arkansas. Huge sweep at home against Arkansas. Your boy called that. I didn't call a sweep, but I called Georgia taking two out of three from Arkansas as that helps out LSU and the SEC West. Alabama sweeps Mizzou. A&M takes two out of three from Kentucky on the road. And then finally, Auburn holds serve at home as they take two out of three from Mississippi State. So that's going to do it for this week's review of the LSU sweep against Ole Miss in Oxford. As always, thank y'all for joining me. Up next, LSU hosts Nichols State on Tuesday night. Then they welcome in Alabama to the box for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. Be on the lookout for the Alabama preview podcast dropping on Wednesday. As a reminder, subscribe to the YouTube channel, comments, uh, hit that notifications bell. I try to respond to all the comments on YouTube, so thank you for the interaction. Once again, follow me on Twitter. I do a lot of live tweeting. I try to answer as many comments uh, on Twitter as possible. That account is at 60FT6IN, LSU pod. And then finally, y'all know where to find the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, and all the other major audio platforms. So until next time, y'all stay safe. And as always, go Tigers.